One other thing is when you're wiring to various components, what you're actually doing is to wire like for like. So for example, this was the joystick which you may remember uh, on the test, uh, one of the first videos when I showed the controller was working. So what I did here was just to maintain part of the old wires so that I know which contacts to connect to what. The joystick of course is already orientated in the correct way so therefore these corresponding four wires to this I only need to wire to the joystick to the correct places as per here. I've had one or two people um, recently asked if I could elaborate um, in terms of what to wire to what and how to connect things to what so therefore I thought it made more sense just to make one video um, to try and show the process to try and keep it sort of simple to follow. A good idea is to start with the basics. Each of these buttons which you see is a sort of copper colour which in effect is what they are um, contains two contacts to make them work. You've got a grounding which is shared by a variety of buttons and you've got what that button actually is. So for example your A, B, start button, C and everything else can have this grounding as being the same because the A will be different to the B to all the other ones. The bottom line is when you're making contact with a button what you're doing is to make these two connections work. Therefore completing it will say, ah, we press button A. Now that's all well and good, but we can't take a direct assumption that every button works to the same ground. Um, a very good example of this is some of the plug and play devices where one half of the board uses a totally different set of groundings to the one on the opposite side. In fact, if you try to connect the two together, the board doesn't work anymore. You try to press a button and nothing happens. If I remember correctly, I think I also came across a similar type of thing with one of the Dreamcast controllers, but I can't swear by that. But uh, in the back of my mind, I think I had an issue also with one of those. If that's the case, this is where one of the big advantages of using these tack switches comes into play. So if you remember, there's two contacts on these. Well, what that means, if you're making a portable, is that one contact can work with one side of the button um, on the contact board and the other pin can work onto the other. So you could, if you wanted to, make each of these tacked buttons completely independent of each other and you're guaranteed to make it work that way. However, if the grounding is the same on the board, you can, as an alternative, I'll just move this across the fraction, use one wire that's soldered to one of these tack switches all the way through. So therefore, if that one wire is connected to the ground, the controller, you've automatically saved yourself a bit of time and effort. So, how do we test grounding? One way, easy way, is to visually look. You see here, with all of the light green colour, that, for example, this part is connected to here, to here and to here. Each of these effectively are ground. They share a common connection. And if we prove that, this is connected to a multimeter and a continuity test uh, which beeps. So if we put one to the other, you'll hear it beep. And here, and here too. Okay, we've established where ground is. If we check on the other side of the board, again we've got a nice clear marked light green area. You can hear that the same contact on one side of the board works with the other. So therefore we have a common ground. One of the things though with connecting to these copper traces, particularly ones that have corroded very slightly through age, is that it's very hard to attach solder um, so that it doesn't literally just drop off or come off. This is where flux comes into the equation. There's a number of types of fluxes around. This may or may not be a good one, but I find it works, so it works for me. What you do is to dab it on 
where you just use some cotton buds just a tiny amount and apply it onto need a little bit more onto that part of the controller when you then using your soldering iron apply some solder to it you'll notice it hisses and fizzes but leaves a very good residue of solder you can then connect your wire straight to that point Certainly in my experience, one of the typical errors that uh, I tend to make is to wire the D-pad back to front. It's actually very easy to do and you can see why it's quite easy to make that mistake because of course the controller is facing you, so therefore up, down, left, right whereas the portable is the other way around, therefore up, down, right, left. So. Bear in mind things of that nature when you're doing the wiring, um, as of course with the C buttons in this example, um, because it will just save you opening up the system having to correct the errors later on. You also notice I tend to use longer wires than I actually need to do. Uh, this wire, for example, could be half that length. However, if I needed, for example, to get to the screen board underneath, then in this configuration, there's a very good chance I could just take the board and lift it to the side. Whereas, of course, if each wire is wired quite tightly, um, you can't do that. It just makes a lot more work for later on. When you wire to any connections, including to these, make sure that the wire is contained within the solder and not just sat on top. reason being is there, then you have a much better uh, contact with the solder and therefore a much better joint. In this example, the left and right are wired up with a D-pad and the grounding is connected also to the outer part of the buttons. Next job is to wire up the rest of it and then to see what we have. Just taking a slight pause from the soldering work just to mention a couple of uh, quick factors if I may. For one thing it's a good idea to have the wires a bit longer not only for um, getting to the board later on but also so that you can move them out of the way when you need to solder to parts that would otherwise be relatively inaccessible. Another thing is that these controller boards all look different depending on the type that you use. This of course is the SuperPad 64 uh, Plus controller. Other ones look differently, will wire it differently. If the ones you have you're having a little bit of trouble with, please register on my forum chat room post some pictures and details of the issues and I'll do my level best to try and uh, give appropriate advice and help out. The details for joining on the forum chat site are on my WordPress site um, so, so if you'd like to um, please feel free to join. So at this stage we've got the C buttons, the A and the B, the start and the D-pad connected. The um, shoulder buttons, these two um, blue wires and the Z1 aren't connected yet because of course let's go towards the back of the case however the rumble joystick and the other parts are all these other wires here are to do with the screen, uh, the volume controls, all that sort of thing and power uh, those can't be assembled properly until the rest of the console is put together the wires as you see although they're reasonably long have all been designed so that they will be concealed inside the case without too much effort at this stage it is important just to double check that everything is OK, at least the parts that you can test. So what I'm going to do is to um, check the screen and the audio still works from the main board. Um, I can't test the controller board until it's plugged into the N64 which will be a bit later on. So consequently the next video will be to do with uh, a partial assembly of the back of the case because eventually of course the two will be marked together and then we can do some tests more uh, appropriately.